uh, what is a drug? Drug molecule that affects uh, biological processes and used to prevent, uh, diagnose, or treat a disease. Uh, drugs can be of natural origin or produced synthetically. The ideal drug should have a specific action to be safe, toxic, without side effects, or as few as possible side effects, to be chemically and uh, metabolically stable, to be synthetical, to be soluble in, in therapeutic concentrations, in avoid precipitation in the bloodstream, uh, within lipids as well in order to lipid membranes and distribute around the body, and finally, to be a unique molecule. In order to exert interact with the human body, molecules in the human body, but uh, the human reacts to the drug. These actions are considered by two major sciences, pharmacodynamics and uh, pharmacokinetics. The pharmacodynamics focuses on the drug effects on the human body. The other name of pharmacodynamics is uh, pharmacology. From the other side, pharmacokinetics focuses on the effects of the human body on the drug when it is available in the body. It's absorption, distribution, uh, metabolism and excretion, the so-called ADMI processes or ADMI properties uh, of drugs. The process of drug and development consists of three stages, uh, drug discovery, preclinical development, and uh, clinical trials. Drug discovery starts uh, with the finding of a heat molecule. So this is a molecule that shows some kind of biological activity. Then uh, this molecule is optimized in of, uh, improving uh, its affinity, its selectivity, reducing toxicity, improving water and lipid solubility, improving ADMI properties in general, and converting the heat molecule into a lead molecule. So the further optimization of the lead molecule delivers the final molecule, which is uh, the drug molecule. Next, uh, there are the uh, preclinical developments. So the preclinical studies are focused on uh, clarifying the mode of action of the drug candidate. It's pharmacokinetic behavior in animals, like bioavailability, toxic metabolites, if any, routes of excretion, efficacy on animal models. Uh, efficacy means uh, therapeutic effect. Uh, drug formulation is developed in this, etap uh, this um, uh, stage. Um, Drug formulation means how drug will be delivered in the human body, like a tablet, like a solution, like an injection. And uh, stability formulation is performed here. Then there are the clinical trials. So the clinical trials are the longest and expensive stage of the process, consists of three phases. In the first phase, up to 100 healthy volunteers are involved of this phase is to evaluate the safety of the drug on human. It's pharmacokinetics in the human body and the immediate side effects, if there are any. In the second phase, the drug is administered to several hundred patients suffering from the target disease. At this phase, the, uh, uh, the short-term safety. Then is the third phase. In the third phase are involved several thousand patients from several clinical centers around the world. The aim of this phase is to collect sufficient data for the efficacy and safety of the drug. If the drug passed successfully this phase, so it's ready for registration and marketing. But the surveillance of the drug doesn't stop here. The drug continues to be observed for safety and uh, side effects. So this uh, last phase is known as uh, post-marketing surveillance phase. And uh, practically, it is uh, endless. It continues until the drug market. The pharmaceutical industry is one of the most uh, successful businesses in the world, affected neither by financial crisis nor political ones because, uh, you know, sick people always exist. And uh, unfortunately, 
uh, the number even increases during crisis. So if we look on the financial reports of five of the top 10 big pharma companies, I mean Pfizer, uh, JSK, Roche, Sanofi and Novartis for the last 10 years, we can see several quite interesting facts. The cost of goods sold is only 23% of the total income of the companies in average. Almost half of the income, 43%, is spent on selling general and administrative, 65%. In order to reduce these expenses, uh, the companies are constantly merging and acquisiting each other. 16% of the total income is reinvested in research and development, which is significantly higher than the average value of 7% for other businesses. So definitely drugs are high value added products. The net income is 18%. Wow. This puts the pharma industry in the top uh, three most profitable industries in the world. The first one is the software industry, the second is the hardware industry, and the third one is uh, the, the, the drug industry. So it's more profitable than the gun industry, that we usually think that is a very profitable business, but no drug industry is better. Uh, actually, this is quite good news, obviously, people make more drugs than guns, or at least sell them more expensively. The cost of developing a drug increases exponentially. It uh, doubles every 10 years. The cost of a new drug for the last 10 years is estimated average in $4 billion. As is the cost of uh, the biodrugs, uh, monoclonal antibodies, diagnostic products, vaccines, uh, why is the process of drug discovery and development more expensive? Because of its low efficiency. From 10,000 sized and tested compounds, around 100 show some activity and safety. 10 of them enter the clinical trials and only one is approved for medical use. Recent studies show that the initial number of tested compounds even passes a million. And this process takes up to 12 years, between eight and 12 years. But uh, with the anti-COVID vaccines last year, uh, we have seen that the time for drug development can be significantly reduced. The drug discovery and development is a high risk business as well. In average, seven of 10 projects are canceled preliminary because of business. So what are these reasons why drugs do not succeed? The main reason is the lack of efficacy or effectiveness. Uh, so there is a tiny difference between efficacy and effectiveness, but uh, they mean one and the same, therapeutic effect. Lack of efficacy means that the drug is effective on animals, on animal models, but when it's administered to humans, the therapeutic is absent or is negligibly small. The second big reason in the past was the pharmacokinetics of the drug. Low bioavailability, toxic metabolites, short or extremely long half-lives. But during the last 20 years, many in silico tools and models have been developed to assess the army properties of drug candidates during the experimental stage. And the attrition rate due to pharmacokinetics reasons decreases from 39% in the past to the current negligible 7%. You see how the in silico methods change the game. Animal toxicity, adverse reactions, commercial and other issues are among the other attrition reasons. So what is the takeaway of all these facts? First of all, drugs are expensive products. They are high value added products. They are kind of uh, luxury goods, non-affordable for most people in this planet. Let's to be clear, most people in this planet have no access to modern drug medication. 
And unfortunately, this won't change for at least the next 100 years. Uh, how the drugs uh, discovered in the past, uh, how they are discovered presently, and uh, how this will be happened in the, in the future. So generally, there are four approaches for drug discovery. Though this one is by serendipity. Serendipity means uh, discovery by chance, trial and error. A newer one is uh, by chemical modifications of known drugs or uh, natural products. Uh, the other one is by screening of databases. And the most advanced method uh, for drug discovery is the rational drug design. This is the smartest way, this is the cheapest way of drug discovery. And let me show you now some examples of drugs discovered by these four different approaches. There are many examples in the history of pharmacy for drugs discovered by serendipity. Starting with the most popular, the story about penicillin, a drug uh, which saved millions of lives during the Second War and uh, for which Fleming Florian Chain received the Nobel Prize in uh, 1945. This drug is still in use for some conditions. Uh, Furosemite is the first uh, diuretic, also was discovered by serendipity. Uh, Cyclosporin. Cyclosporin was testing as an anti-tubercular antibiotic, but became the first immunosuppressive drug that uh, changed the science and practice of organ transplantation. And the latest story is about uh, sildenafil by Agra, which was uh, developing as an antihypertensive drug, but is becoming one of the best-selling ever drugs, leading to an entirely new pharmacological group in modern pharmacology. By chemical modification was discovered aspirin, the acetyl salicylic acid. It was uh, acetylated the salicylic acid. Salicylic acid is a natural product. The aim of this modification was to increase the stability and to reduce the irritating effect of salicylic acid on the stomach uh, mucosa. Aspirin is a product, it's not a drug. Aspirin is a product. Salicylic acid is the drug. Salicylic acid is the active metabolite of aspirin. Uh, ranitidine is a chemical modification of uh, simitidine with uh, increased uh, half-life. Pindulol originates from propranolol, but avoids the first pass effect in the liver and shows higher bioavailability. By random screening was the first sulfonomate drug, uh, Prontosil, when a great number of colorants have been screened for antibacterial activity. Screening also is used presently. The screening could be performed in vitro, experimentally, or in silic, virtual screening. Duration of the drug most advanced approach of drug discovery. It's clear this now. Uh, drug design begins with uh, identification of a biological target. This is a macromolecule which is involved in the disease. Then uh, compound interacting with this macromolecule is discovered, the so-called uh, heat molecule. And then it comes an iterative process of structure optimization until the compound is delivered with optimal selectivity, affinity, non-toxicity, solubility, permeability, etc., etc., properties which are needed for a molecule to become a drug. Uh, there are two main approaches in drug design, ligand-based and structurist uh, drug design. When the structure of the target macromolecule is unknown, the structure of the ligand is designed and optimized based on the relationship between structure and activity. So this is the ligand-based drug design, focuses on the ligand. But if the 3D structure of the target macromolecule is known, then the ligand is designed to be complementary to the binding site on the macromolecule. Complementary means uh, steric, electrostatic, and hydrophobic fitting. So this is the structure-based drug design. It's focused on the structure, on the macromolecule. 
There are several major achievements in the science of drug design that uh, uh, made it uh, the, main, the main approach in the current and the future drug discovery. So first of them is the understanding of drug receptor recognition. In the early 1890, Mew Fisher compared the drug receptor interaction to the key and lock interplay. Consider that both uh, drug and receptor interacted solid bodies uh, and uh, without changing their conformations. Uh, lately, uh, Daniel Koshlan suggested that both molecules undergo conformational changes during the interaction and adopt the most suitable conformation in order to connect each other. So this hypothesis has been proven many times by X-ray structures, by silico simulations, and now it's known that molecules indeed change their conformations during the interaction and adopt conformations that fit optimally each other uh, contact surfaces. I mentioned many times uh, target uh, macromolecule. What is a target molecule? So target macromolecule is an internal molecule, endogenous molecule, uh, which is involved in the disease. Affecting the fun function of target macromolecule could change the etiology of the disease, could change the pathophysiology or improve the symptoms. Of the 20,000 protein coding genes in genome, about 3,000 have been estimated to be part of the so-called draggable genome or draggable proteins. What means draggable proteins? So these proteins are able to bind drug-like molecules, small molecules, which means they have a binding site. Here in a ring, in the inner ring is given the human proteome divided in uh, four different groups into the uh, target development level. Target development level means uh, uh, how much you, we know about a given protein. Uh, the clinical, this 3%, these are proteins which are related to at least one approved drug. So this group can 659 proteins currently. Here in the outer ring and the protein families. So 3%, 16% uh, belongs to gamma protein couple receptors. So these are receptors. 3% are nuclear receptors. 21% are ion channels. Uh, 25% are enzymes. 4% are transported proteins, 9% are uh, different types of kinases, and the rest, 22%, belong to uh, different other proteins. Uh, many of them uh, are orphan receptors. The chemical, this one in the green, the 6%, uh, includes proteins uh, known to bind with high potency to small molecules, but these small molecules are not yet drugs but these proteins have a binding site. Uh, Tibiology, this in pink here given, 53%, includes uh, proteins that have any link to any disease, but they haven't been studied for binding to small molecules. And TDARC, 38%, the remaining 38%, uh, contains the unstudied, and totally unstudied uh, proteins. Uh, so you see there is a huge field for uh, future discoveries. Uh, since uh, 2014, there has been an initiative funded by the National Institutes of Health aiming to illuminate the druggable genome. All new data discovered in this and similar projects are collected in a specially designed website, uh, which is called FARUS. So FARUS contain all the druggable uh, proteins which are known by now and the 
uh, any information is collected here. The 3D structures of proteins are resolved by X-ray crystallography, NMR scopy, and more recently by the modern cryogenic electron microscopy and collected in the protein data bank, which currently contains more than uh, 180,000 uh, structures. Some of them are single proteins in apoforms without a ligand, but uh, some of them are in complexes with uh, ligands. And this information is more valuable because it shows where the binding site is on the macromolecule. Another great achievement in drug design has been the invention of automated methods in synthetic chemistry. This uh, automation allows this a great amount of new compounds generated as uh, combinatorial libraries and uh, they high throughput screening. A thousand compounds uh, could be tested per day this way. But the major achievement in drug design is the development of in silico modeling technologies applied for virtual screening, for compounds uh, design, for energy calculations, uh, SAR and QSR analysis, uh, ADMI modeling, modeling of drug uh, target, target interactions. But in order to be applied all these advanced technologies, the molecular structure should be encoded numerically. The encoded uh, structures can be analyzed, can be searched, can be visualized, compared to each other. So it's very important first step in uh, the process of drug design. Uh, the structures could be encoded by uh, binary strings, could be encoded by smiles uh, strings, could be encoded uh, as uh, 2D graphs or as uh, 3D, 3D structures. The 3D molecular modeling and uh, visualization also uh, are considered among the greatest achievements in drug design technologies. Uh, the molecular properties should be encoded. Different types of descriptors have been de developed over the years. Uh, they could be divided into 1D descriptors, 2D descriptors, descriptors, and uh, descriptor sets. Uh, the 1D descriptors are derived ID structure, ID descriptor is regular weight, ID descriptor is element composition. Uh, the 2D descriptors are derived from the molecular graph, and the 2D descriptors are the number of uh, hydrogen bond acceptors, for example, hydrogen bond donors. Um, the distribution coefficients log P, log D, solubility, number of rotatable bonds, molecular fragments, different type of indices, all this information could be extracted from the 2D structure of the molecules. Uh, the 3D descriptors are generated from the 3D structures. A molecular volume is a 3D descriptor, molecular surface area is a 3D, especially the polar surface area, which is very important molecular descriptor. And uh, finally, uh, the descriptor sets, they contain a set of numbers, a set of numbers describing a complex property or a set of numbers uh, describing a set of properties, but they are used uh, as a set, not separately. Uh, once uh, there is a quantitative description of a set of structures and the quantitative measurement of the activities like IC50s, EC50s, uh, KDs, then different types of quantitative analysis can be applied. And Corey Hench did this for the first time in 1964 when uh, correlated the antimicrobial of penicillin derivatives with uh, descriptors uh, relating to hydrophobic and electronic properties of molecules. So these type of models where the molecular descriptors are the independent variables and activity is the dependent variable is known as uh, quantitative structure activity relationship models. So these are the QSR models. And Corey Hench, is considered the father of drug design. Uh, 
Lately, in the analysis have been involved methods like principal component analysis, partially squares, uh, chemometrics evolved into chemoinformatics, including uh, molecular modeling, chemical information, and tools and algorithms to handle this enormous amount of data coming from the combinatorial chemist HTC, which were very popular in the 1990s. At the same time, bioinformatics also emerged to organize and analyze medical data, uh, the amount of which also increased dramatically, especially after the deciphering of the human genome. Nowadays, the structure activity relationships are analyzed by machine learning methods like random forest, decision trees, exgibus, uh, neural networks, uh, canyers, neighbors, support vector machines. Uh, many authors classify these methods as uh, black box methods because they're not able to distinguish between relevant and irrelevant for the activity descriptors, as the regression methods do, for example but uh, they use uh, all variables at once, but they're very good in predictions and classification, significantly better than the statistical analysis and the regression models. Uh, both type of methods do not replace each other nor contradict, they are complementary. They should be used in combination. And here comes the artificial intelligence. So there are many definitions of artificial intelligence. I don't think that uh, AI needs a definition, it's a self expression but well, if I have to give one, I would say that uh, AI is a pipeline of uh, machine learning methods, algorithms, and it's able to mimic human intelligence, to mimic, I underline, not to substitute, to mimic. Uh, Siri, Alexa is AI. Self-driving cars are AI. Google Discover, Netflix recommendations. So all these are AI application. There are many examples of AI in our everyday life. AI has invaded drug discovery, all fields of this process. AI is not the future, it's the present of drug discovery. In drug design, AI is used to predict the 3D structure of proteins. AI predicts the drug-protein interactions. It uh, determines uh, drug activity, construct molecules, they know. In pharmacology, AI is used to design specific molecules as well as multi-target drugs. In chemicals, as AI is able to design synthetic root, it's able to predict reaction yield, to clarify reaction mechanisms. AI is quite good to identify new therapeutic targets to all drugs, so-called drug repurposing. Drug repurposing means uh, we find new indications for old drugs. Uh, finally, AI is uh, replace irreplaceable, meaning like predicting toxicity, bioavailability, admin properties, physical chemical properties, uh, here on the right side, I have listed uh, some most popular AI platforms used in drug design, like the Swiss uh, drug design system developed by the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, very uh, freely accessible, very good working platform. Of course, AlphaFold, Google's DeepMind platform for prediction of 3D structure of proteins. Uh, biosymmetrics uh, contingent predicts drug tar target interactions and mode of action. Merck's uh, Cynthia uh, proposes possible synthesizing roots for a given compound. Uh, Cyclicus, um, Cyclicus ligand express finds possible protein uh, targets for a given small molecule. And many others constantly appear in. Uh, every day. Oops, sorry. Oops, what happened? Well, sorry about this. 
Attention, I would like to pay to AstraZeneca's artificial platform for the novel design of small molecules named reInvent. The platform is able to generate small molecules that uh, satisfy a diverse set of criteria. You define a set of criteria and the platform generates a set of molecules corresponding criteria. So the most interesting thing here for us is the brain behind the platform. So this is Atanas Patronus, one of our ex-PhD students, now an associate principal scientist in AstraZeneca. He designed and developed this platform. Some of you know him. He has presented several times in our praise schools before. I suggested you, the organizers, next time to invite him to give him a presentation in the next praise school. Uh, how the platform works is shown in this presentation at the given link. It, I recommend you to have a look. It is quite interesting. Mm, well, uh, data visualization also is of great importance uh, for drug design. Uh, here also have been several great achievements. Uh, all of them were possible because of the invention of molecular mechanics. The molecular mechanics is based on a set of empirical energy functions called a force field. The force field is able to describe the total energy of the system, and it consists of several terms like bond strength energy term, bond angle energy, torsional energy, uh, different types of interactions like Van der Waals, electrostatic, hydrogen bond formation, all these uh, interactions are considered in the equation of molecular uh, mechanics. Based on molecular mechanics, there are very useful and widely used techniques for visualization of drug receptor interactions have been developed. These are dynamics, molecular docking, virtual screening. Molecular dynamics is a method for uh, simulating the movements of molecules and their interactions in different based on the force field. MD provides information that could not be obtained by any experimental method for 3D structure resolution, like crystallography, spectroscopy, and microscopy. These methods give a static picture of the molecule and the complex of molecules, so they take uh, snapshots. MD makes a movie. It, make, it records the movement of molecules. It shows how the molecules uh, connect each other, interact each other. He's the MD simulation between a human leukocyte protein in red is given uh, with a peptide bound uh, into the binding site given in blue. Uh, this simulation was generated in our lab as a part of a study on peptide binding prediction to uh, HLA proteins. Actually, in Bulgaria, we have good traditions in molecular dynamics. Uh, there are several old MD schools and experienced scientists uh, in this field, and you will see and hear them over the next few days. Molecular docking predicts the amount of binding between two molecules, the mutual orientation of the mass, the conformation of each molecule, and estimates the energy of the complex. As lower is the energy, as more stable is the complex. Virtual screening is a method for searching a structure with specific elements, so-called pharmacophore. So this is the pharmacophore search method, one of the ligand-based methods in drug design. Virtual screening can be also searched for a structure able to bind to a specific binding site. So this is the docking-based virtual screening, which is one of the structure-based methods in drug design. And the very top of the automation and artificial intelligence in drug design are these uh, two robots, Adam and Eve, by Ross King and Stephen Oliver from the University of Manchester. 
Adam was constructed to microbiological experiments, analyze the results itself, define hypothesis itself, design experiments to test this hypothesis itself, and repeat this cycle until validated hypothesis derived. This is a more advanced robot. It works in the field of drug discovery. Uh, it is able, or maybe I have to say she, she is able to screen experimentally thousands of compounds per day, to discover specific hits, to engineer a specific cell line to test the hits, and then to optimize their structures to deliver lead compounds. So what is the takeaway from the history of uh, drug design, the presence, and what will be the future of drug design? So it's that any advance in technology finds immediately its application in medicine, in pharmacy, in drug discovery and development. The priorities of any new technology. Any investment in drug design is worthwhile because as better is designed a given drug candidate during the experimental stage, the stage of drug design, as less likely is for this drug to fail in the late stages where the tests are more expensive, especially in the clinical trials. The future drug design relies on artificial intelligence, no doubt about that. The ultimate goal of the future drug design is to be able to design and develop a specific, non-toxic, effective, and patient-tailored drug for a few hours time only. For few hours time only. So this is the ultimate goal. So I'm not sure when this goal will be achieved, but I'm sure that this is an achievable goal. So wait and see. Or at least those of you who are alive. Well, in the end of my lecture, I'll show you some results from our recent drug design studies. Uh, here some time ago, uh, we performed a docking-based virtual screening on a set from Zinc database containing more than 6 million small molecules in order to identify novel hits uh, as acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are involved in the treatment of uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. They treat the disease, they improve the symptoms, they do not cure the disease. Uh, the top 10 best scored hits from the virtual screening were synthesized, here are they, uh, and tested in vitro for affinity to the enzyme for neurotoxicity, for intestinal and blood-brain barrier permeability. The affinity to the enzyme was measured by isothermal titration calorie, calorimetry. Uh, nine of the compounds, here are the rest. nine of the 10 compounds are good binders, um, significantly better than galantamine. Galantamine is a classical acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Eight of them uh, are non-toxic in concentrations up to 100 micromoles through in uh, this outline Neuro2A. All of them are able to cross uh, the barrier and the gastrointestinal These uh, two experiments were performed by parallel artificial membrane permeability assay, so-called the PAMB tests. So in general, by this technique, virtual uh, docking-based virtual screening, we discovered seven new uh, hits as potential acetylcholinesterase uh, inhibitors, non-toxic and uh, permeable through the uh, intestine and through the blood-brain barrier. The other study that I would like to show you is more theoretical. By MD simulation, we clarified the mechanism of anti-aggregant activity of uh, curcumin on amyloid uh, beta aggregation. Uh, 
Uh, the amyloid uh, plaques are one of the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. Their formation starts with um, aggregation of um, monomers into a nucleus. Uh, the monomers here in the area range and form a fibro. And this fibro increases in length. And uh, when uh, several fibro uh, aggregate, they form the plaque. We simulated the interactions of two molecules, which are meters of amyloid aggregation, with a set of 12 amyloid peptides. So these two molecules were uh, curcumin and uh, ferulic acid. Curcumin is uh, considered as uh, a strong inhibitor of the aggregation with IC50 0.8 micromoles. Uh, ferulic acid is a weak uh, inhibitor with T5.5. Uh, these two molecules are very similar. Uh, curcumin consists of two ferulics. Uh, we model five systems, one consisting of uh, 12 uh, amyloid monomers, uh, second one consisting of uh, 12 monomers and 12 randomly positioned curcumin molecules. Uh, the third one consists of these uh, 12 monomers and 36 randomly positioned curcumin molecules. And other two uh, systems uh, containing 12 and 36 uh, ferulic acids. The systems were uh, solvated in isotonic solution, energy minimized, heated uh, to 300 Kelvin degrees, equilibrated and simulated for one microsecond at constant pressure and temperature, classical MD protocol. On the right side are presented uh, the system in, at the end of the simulation. So you can see that the curcumin molecules are bound inside the amyloid uh, nucleus, while most of the acids are spread around the core. So some of them are bound inside, but most of them are outside the core. Uh, we analyze the trajectories of the complexes, and these results uh, show how uh, curcumin affects the amyloid aggregation, what it is doing on the amyloids. First of all, it stabilizes the backbone fluctuations here, are given the RMSF values. In the presence of curcumin, 12 or 36, uh, the fluctuations of uh, the backbone atoms of uh, the amyloid peptides decreases. They uh, are less flexible in the presence of curcumin. Uh, the surface, the solvent accessible surface area, this SASA uh, parameter, increases in the presence of curcumin, especially at high concentration, which means that uh, the nucleus is getting bigger, is getting bigger because curcumin bounce inside increases the volume of the nucleus. The number of non-native uh, uh, con contacts between sites decreases in the presence of curcumin, decreases the number of hydrogen bonds between the peptides in the presence of curcumin. So, in general, we concluded that um, curcumin affect uh, the primary nucleation. Uh, it's intercalating between the uh, amyloid peptides in the nucleus, increases the site of the core, and uh, prevents uh, the peptides uh, to form uh, contacts be, uh, between them and to form hydrogen bonds. So this is the explanation, the in silico explanation of the mechanism of anti-aggregant activity of uh, curcumin. Uh, well, at the end, I would like uh, to thank uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizations that uh, funding our studies. I thank the Center of Excellence in Mathematics and uh, ICT, the National Center for High Performance and Distributing, and the Bulgarian National uh, Science Fund. Thank you for your attention. So we have time for some.
some questions. Thank you, Professor Dutinova, for the excellent overview and for the critical assessment of related to drug discovery and drug development. I think we have a couple of minutes for several questions. So all participants are welcome to have some questions in the chat if they have. In the meantime, there was one question already at the beginning of the lecture. I'm going to read it to you. In the case of the corona vaccines, were all phases of clinical testing fulfilled? Yes, definitely. Without fulfilling all the stages, they will not be approved. The fact is that all these um, investigations, all these studies have been made in very short time. But the, this short time was not because uh, some of the stages were skipped. They were, uh, the shortness uh, comes from um, decreasing the amount of uh, administrative regulations which take a huge amount. The amount of uh, the time for the clinical trials is, is spent in uh, administrative regulations. So this was uh, reduced, no doubt about. Okay. All the, these vaccines are uh, tested uh, following all, all the rules of uh, drug design and discovery. Okay. Uh, maybe you can... The chat for the next question. If not, and why drugs are tested on animals since animals are different? Some good drugs may be rejected, drugs good for animals may be poor in case of humans. Uh, there is a good question, a very good question. But uh, for the uh, time of uh, developing of drug design and development of drugs, uh, animal models are not avoidable. So in silico methods is an alternative to replace the animal models. And uh, there are many uh, in silico models already uh, replacing the animal toxicity tested in uh, animal models. So this is the way. Yet yeah, in silico, uh, we will reduce the animal tests. Okay. And maybe the final question before we proceed. Could you comment a little bit about the protocol for virtual you ran using docking? For example, what docking approach did you use as to screen the whole thing? I think uh, in the um, agenda there is a special lecture, lecture on, drug, uh, on virtual screening and uh, molecular docking. So the details uh, you you can uh, hear and see there. It's a long protocol, there are different protocols, and yeah, you will study how is this is doing.